Hello and welcome to the first in a series of podcasts entitled Connecting the World of Railways, A Conversation With, brought to you by the International Union of Railways, the UIC. My name is Simon Fletcher, Director of Europe at the UIC, and I'm delighted to be your host. We are especially pleased to be able to launch this series, which will be available to download. Unique in its configuration, the UIC, the International Union of Railways, is the global association that represents the railway companies in all regions of the world and which works on a wide range of technical and operational solutions to facilitate the evolution of the railways as the sustainable backbone of the mobility mix. It is my privilege to introduce our guest for today, Gianluigi Castelli, current president of FSI in Italy and chair of the UIC. He is an advisor to the Italian Government Ministry for Innovation and Digitalization and went on to take the role of chairman of the FSI board in 2018. He became chair of the UIC in 2019 and has helped steer the association through the recent pandemic. As he approaches the end of his mandate as our president, we explore with him a number of topical subjects, recall some personal reflections and take a little peek at what he thinks the railways of tomorrow will look like. Gianluigi, first of all, welcome to this podcast, which, by the wonders of modern technology, some of which I'm sure you helped to design, we are able to undertake this uh, little chat with you in Italy um, and me in France. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you in this conversation today. Maybe... Maybe saying that I help to design some of the technology we use every day these days, uh, it's a little bit too much. So I've been involved in uh, <laughs> high tech for a long, long while. Uh, in the past, uh, in the past years, I would uh, say that uh, I probably managed to adopt some good uh, technologies in the companies I served over the time to improve their overall performance. So. Unfortunately, I'm not a contributor of this uh, of this kind of technologies. It would be much more fun, I think, for me. <laughs> I'm sure you're being very modest, Gianluigi, but that's something which I think is a, a real trait of, of the way in which you've approached your presidency um, of the UIC. But more, I think, uh, relevant at the moment is that the past 18 months or so have been an exceptionally challenging period for us all as individuals, but even more of a challenge for railway companies right around the world. Lockdowns have meant that people have stayed at home. Uh, there have been far less passengers on the trains, and whilst freight traffic may not have been so profoundly affected, the railways have been economically uh, impacted. From where you are sitting, Gianluigi, how strong do you feel the recovery is now? Uh, because I think we can safely say that there are now good signs of recovery. And what do the railways need to be doing, probably collaboratively, um, to encourage the shoots to grow? Well, well, well. It is very clear, Simon, that uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, has been very heavy from whatever standpoint uh, we look at it. Uh, the toll on lives, uh, the impact on social life, uh, the economic impacts. It's been a real disaster. I'm uh, 67 years years old tomorrow, and I've never seen anything like that in, in all of my life. So coming to, to, to the subject of, of the impact on the transport industry, it is clear that it has been heavily impacted in general, not just the train transport, but the air transport industry and the old kind of, of transport have been heavily impacted. Maybe, maybe with the exception of freight, which uh, uh, during the pandemics uh, also that we have observed uh, an explosion of, uh, of e-commerce uh, and uh, the e-commerce all across the world has really stimulated the, the use of uh, uh, freight to, to move uh, goods uh, from one side of the world to the other side. Coming to the recovery, it's, I think it is very difficult to make an exact uh, prediction because there are plus and minuses uh, in our industry as a result of the actions that uh, came have been put in place after the pandemics. If I look on the positive side, I think that there is a strong pressure by all the governments and uh, 
Specifically, we know all the actions that have been put in place by the European Commission here in Europe to reduce uh, the carbon footprint uh, of all kinds of transportation. We all know that the train is the safest and the greenest transport mean. So this strong uh, stimuli to use the train will for sure result uh, in a positive uh, Uh, increase of passengers uh, and goods being moved uh, by train. If we look at uh, the passenger side, uh, we have seen that some countries uh, are even forbidding uh, internal flights uh, if there are convenient uh, rail services available. No? I think that the most uh, visible action in this sense has been France uh, recently. No? Uh, but I think that uh, at least here in Europe, uh, Uh, many other countries will follow this example. Thinking to business travels, I think that uh, uh, new habits that have been forced by the pandemic and that have been uh, very well supported by uh, communication technologies, as you said in, in, in your foreword, uh, we are having this conversation today, you are in Paris, I'm in Milan, it's very much as if we were together. So these new habits have been established and uh, smart or remote working have shown that uh, uh, almost, if not all meetings can be done effectively without the need of a physical presence. Uh, it seems to me that what um, Nicolas Negroponte in 1995, Nicolas Negroponte is professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, he predicted in a book, or at least he was hoping in his book, to use this uh, telecommunication means in a more intense way. And in fact, he said, move bits, not atoms. And uh, this is what we are seeing. Now, If these habits will change again after the end of the pandemic and we will go through a full recovery, it's difficult to say, but definitely I think that the impact on business travels will, will be there. On the other end, the positive side is uh, uh, traveling for leisure. After people have been closed in their home for months, uh, a year or so, I think that uh, after this period of restriction will be over, people will really want to travel. Maybe not in other continents, but uh, to closer locations. And in this case, again, the train is the perfect means. So I think that the leisure travels uh, will give a boost uh, to, to our in industry. And uh, uh, considering uh, that the recovery plan is giving uh, a huge boost to the development of infrastructure too, at least here in Europe, uh, in terms of uh, extending the network of high-speed trains, uh, making multimodality in transport uh, a reality. I'm positive also that in the midterm, the scenario for our industry will uh, be positive, definitely. Now, I think you've hit the nail quite quite nicely on the head with some of those aspects, uh, Gian Gianluigi, because I think where, where you've got the... Um, Uh, the number of people perhaps um, now working from home and mu much like you and I are doing right now, of course, and able to have this conversation means that people are traveling less for, for business purposes. But as you said, the flip side of that is, is that maybe there are more people now who will be traveling for leisure, for going on holiday, leave the car at home, Uh, because uh, who wants to be caught up in a 30-kilometer traffic jam when they can whiz past in the nice train where we've had lots and lots of trials done um, during the pandemic to prove that, that trains are not a transmitter of the virus in the way that some people perhaps would have you believe. And of course, not only that, but also the renaissance of night trains, I think, is something that uh, people are now starting to think about traveling by train, leave the car at home, Go, take the train overnight and arrive in the same destination as they would have done if they'd taken a, a flight. And But their carbon footprint, of course, is that much uh, sort of much lower. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen that experience in Italy as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I totally share what you are saying. We are observing uh, a, an increase of passengers uh, uh, using uh, uh, night trains 
Until some times ago, there was a, a declining kind of transportations, but instead now we see that people are using night trains and there is an increase of usage of the, of these kind of services. And that's, uh, that's very positive. And uh, also I would say that if we look at uh, the new generation of trains, uh, uh, for example, but it's just an example. Here in Italy, we are launching a new regional mid-range trains that have been specifically designed to accommodate uh, comfortably also bicycles uh, and the like. So uh, you see that, uh, again, people can use the train, uh, bringing their bicycle, arriving at the destination, being a tourist uh, using bike. Uh, also, I think that uh, dedicated the lanes for bikes are becoming more and more common uh, all over Europe. In some countries, it was already very much uh, developed, in some other less. But there are now investments by the local authorities to stimulate the use of bicycle, protecting bikers uh, from the rest of the traffic. And integrating Integrating, therefore, the train with bikes and the like, it's really creating a new way, new opportunities of traveling that uh, I think people are appreciating more and more. So it's, I, I'm positive about that. It's fair to say, I think, that um, far from being uh, down in the dumps about the... Uh, um, as we would say in English, about the fact that um, traffic was down during the last 18 months. There is there is an opportunity. We have a very interesting expression in English, every cloud has a silver lining. So we've seen this nasty grey cloud go across, which was the pandemic, and now, now what we can start to see is the silver lining as the light starts to emerge, and we can start to look at some of these new these new business um, opportunities. And part of the, part, I think, of the tool for evolving uh, the railways going forward, the railways of tomorrow, shall we call it that, uh, and of course extracting us from uh, the economic clutches of the pandemic um, is the use of digital solutions that have radically changed our economies over the last 20 years. We have seen a huge a huge uptake, I think, in a number of sort of uh, solutions uh, which one could use as, as examples of digitization, but much is made about that, and some commentators would try and argue that this is only a buzzword when it comes to the railways. With several diplomas, laureates, and the recipient of numerous awards, Gianluigi, your pedigree over the 40-plus career uh, that you have had is in the sciences with a strong emphasis on physics, telecommunications, information technology, and cybernetics. Having held several posts such as CTO and Global IT Director for Vodafone, you joined FSI in 2016 as Executive Vice President of Innovation and Information Systems. With a clear focus on research, innovation and digitalization, you set about to revolutionize FSI's use of technology. What is your message to the railway professionals listening to this podcast and the roles they can play in embracing what is, quite frankly, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reconstitute the railways to something even better than before the pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, uh, before I get into the impact of digital in, in our industry, I want to make uh, a couple of more general uh, considerations and remarks. The first one is that digital is everywhere. Even uh, traditional uh, bricks and mortar industries are directly or indirectly impacted. There are plenty of examples. Look, for example, at the lodging and how Airbnb has changed this industry. Looking at local transports, uh, how taxis uh, have not been actually replaced, but how Uber is impacting the use of uh, shared vehicles uh, in our cities. Or the oil and gas industry, where uh, only through extensive seismic uh, simulation is possible to be competitive and uh, uh, have the economical sustainability in exploration and production. As an example, Eni, which is the Italian large oil and gas company, has just invested to roll out uh, more than 55 uh, petaflops uh, of uh, high-performance computing power to run uh, seismic simulation. 55 petaflops means uh, 55 millions of billions of mathematical operations per second. And this is the only way to estimate uh, precisely and accurately the size and exploitability of uh, a reservoir. 
And uh, if you don't do that, you will waste money because exploratory will cost 20 up to 100 million euros and maybe they are dry. That is, uh, you don't find anything there because you have made a hole in the wrong place. So uh, it is of paramount importance, uh, the ability of uh, uh, simulating uh, the shape of the reservoir, its uh, physical characteristics uh, to uh, properly invest uh, in uh, the next steps of extracting oil. This is just uh, an example. In our industry, of course, uh, high-speed trains can run safely, exploiting uh, the full capacity of the network only because of the tight interaction between the train and uh, the infrastructure. No? The ERMTS is, is the European standard for allowing also trains to be interoperable across the European network instead of being able to run only on national, national networks. So... Uh, you see that uh, digital is really everywhere and uh, there is no industry can say, oh, yes, but we are different because we are very physical and the impact of digital will be small, uh, if not uh, negligible at all. If uh, uh, some industry think about that, uh, uh, they will be washed out by the competition. The competition who make uh, a good use of digital technologies will invent uh, new services, will run their processes more efficiently. Everything will change. But there is a but, which is uh, the hype. Around the digital technologies, there is a lot of hype. And this means that uh, some investments uh, are not real investments, but are waste of money and resources. So the recommendation I can give to our industry, but in general to all industry that are uh, thinking about uh, how to use digital technologies and what kind of digital technology would be most uh, effective in their specific market is uh, be a savvy adopter. Don't follow the fashion. Bring in-house the necessary competencies uh, you need to have to properly assess the value of a digital technology and how to use it in, it in your specific context. So if you do that, your investment will be, will be good. And for sure, I'm sure uh, there will be a huge return on the investment. If you just follow the fashion, and uh, there is a huge chance that you will just uh, waste money. About applications, for example, in our industry, uh, we often talk about the railways being the backbone of a multimodal integrated mm. transport system. But uh, for this to happen, it is necessary to have digital platforms that bring together all the players of uh, multimodality uh, transport. So car sharing, uh, bike sharing, uh, buses, uh, local uh, uh, transportations in city, all this. Even joint ticketing, Gianluigi. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You have to have the ability to plan, to know what is available in the place you are arriving with the train because you, are not, you don't necessarily know what's available in terms of uh, public mm. or shared transportations. And you should be able to plan your trip and to buy with one single transaction all the tickets that are needed to fulfill your, your trip. And if something changes during the trip, there is a delay or whatever, these kind of platforms can help you replan the rest of your journey. Yeah, we all carry smartphones these days. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, without the digital platforms of this kind, uh, this is simply, is simply not, uh, uh, not possible. And, uh, of course, if we look forward, also new transport means uh, will appear uh, that will be 100% uh, enabled by digital technology. Mm. I'm thinking to the Hyperloop. Yep. Some people believe that uh, this is a science fiction, but uh, let's see. In the next few years, what will happen about the development of this of this technology, or what happening with the Boring Company by Elon Musk? You know, the mm. Boring Company is this company which is loading your car in a sort of a very small train. It's not a train, but which runs underground and delivers your car with you on board at the station. You get out again on the surface again, and then you start uh, driving again. Again, only through digital technology this is uh, possible. Or 
imagine the short range drones that uh, are, they are electric okay and uh, that are fully automatic in terms of piloting and uh, only digital technology would allow this to happen and avoid uh, mid air condition uh, yeah. collisions uh, between yeah. these uh, drones so really um but even if we look at the more conventional things we made an interesting example um, an experiment in Ferrovia dello Stato in Italy. There is a well-known problem that is the uh, most effective uh, allocation of trucks in station. That's the scarce resources, okay? Mm. Trains mm. Uh, are never uh, really on time. So there is a continuous replanning about uh, how allocate, to allocate the, the track to the, to, to the train. It's a very complex problem, which uh, even with very powerful computers, it will take uh, tens of minutes, if not hours, to compute the optimized uh, schema. Okay, so currently what happens is there is a man or a woman, a person who looks at what's happening and allocates the trains to the proper to the proper track. Using uh, a kneeling quantum, quantum computer, we had an agreement with uh, Enesa Labs in California. They allowed us to use their annealing quantum computer, and uh, uh, my team uh, developed uh, a, a new algorithm for, from that. And the result is that uh, with uh, 19 uh, trucks in Florence, the problem can be solved uh, in less than one second. So this would become a real-time application. It's not yet the case because uh, these computers are not uh, yet uh, generally available. But in a very short period of time, a few years, they will be available. And so this will revolutionize the way we uh, make an efficient use of what is for, for us, for train operators, uh, the scarce resource in our world. I could go on for hours. Yeah. <laughs> Simon, I could go on but for I, I hours. But I was just thinking this would be a fascinating uh, subject for a further podcast, and, and possibly why not? I mean, but what you're describing with the use of the quantum computing today uh, and the fact that it's not widely available, of course, is if you wind the clock back 10 years and tell somebody that one day they would have that they would have a smartphone in their pocket or maybe 15 years, but you, they would have this smartphone in their pocket with, with, with 128 or more gigabyte of data and that tiny little thing which is in their pocket, they would have called you stupid. Uh, um, but, but look... But look, Absolutely. today everybody is carrying a smartphone yeah. and look at the power, the computing power. I said to my wife the other day, do you remember that first computer we bought uh, oof, back in the late 90s? Eight megabytes of memory. <laughs> and today you can buy computers which have got several terabytes and they're smaller than they look. But so look at the advances that have happened over the years. In the railway sector, Gianluigi, I completely agree with you. We need to embrace that. Uh, and I think your message about making sure that companies have got the right resources to be able to take these developments and to embrace the development and to, in, and to utilize it as part of developing the business model, I think is a really interesting and really, really something that we need to be taking forward. Gianluigi, um, as you reach the, uh, the end of your mandate as president of the UIC, Perhaps you could share with us your vision of railway transportation over, say, the next 5, 10, and 15 years. What do you see emerging? Is there likely to be some kind of digital revolution? And where might the railways be in terms of market share when compared with other modes of transport? Well, well, well Simon, <laughs> I was expecting a, a question like this, <laughs> which is one of the most uh, difficult uh, to answer for various reasons. No? As, as a good friend of mine says, uh, his name is Vito Di Bari, and uh, he is a futurologist, uh, he says, there is only one prediction I like to make, that uh, tomorrow there will not be the end of the world. Because if uh, tomorrow the end of the world will not be there, I was right. So yeah. good prediction. <laughs> if it will be there, nobody will be there to complain because my <laughs> prediction was wrong. So uh, now, now trying, uh, trying to be serious uh, about this, it's, it's honestly difficult to say where we will be in 5, 10 or 15 years. Uh, why? We tend uh, to look uh, backwards uh, and uh, to draw a line from where, say, we were five years ago and try to project where we'll be in uh, in in five years. So this is a typical uh, linear approach. We tend to think this way. So it's a linear approach. If uh, 
I see where we are today and I look backward where we were five years ago. I make a sort of uh, elaboration and I try to say where we will be in five years from now in a linear way. But uh, we have plenty of examples that uh, phenomena, most phenomena are actually exponential, are not linear. And uh, digital phenomena are... Uh, the, the exponent itself is exponential. So the speed of growth of change is, uh, is extremely, extremely fast. And uh, we tend to underestimate uh, the actual impact of technology. Or to be more precise, we tend to overestimate what will happen uh, tomorrow. Okay, because of the hype, I was saying before, uh, artificial intelligence is going to change our lives uh, tomorrow. It will not happen tomorrow. It will happen, will happen a little bit more ahead in time. But when we look at that ahead in time, then we underestimate the impact uh, and the impact actually will be much bigger than we can predict. So with this in mind, I, I, I try to make my predictions to 5, 10, 15 years uh, ahead. I think that uh, in five years, also because of the time and the investment needed to roll out uh, new infrastructure, next generation trains, and so on and so forth, I think that there will not be big, ch- very, very big changes. Our train will be probably more comfortable with uh, high-speed trains uh, reaching uh, uh, more places uh, and uh, having uh, international networks better connected, okay? Particularly in Europe, the efforts by the European Commission to create uh, European corridors, okay, that integrate all the different regions, not saying countries, of Europe, uh, will will result uh, in a much better set of uh, services uh, uh, all across Europe, uh, reducing the usage of uh, cars, private cars, and planes. In 10 years, uh, trains uh, probably will go faster by using the existing networks. So without the need for huge new investments, just the trains will go faster. And in some cases, maybe we will see maglev becoming more widespread with speeds that will be almost the double of existing one. Why trains do not go faster today through the technology? You know that the air resistance grows with the square of the speed and therefore energy consumption will go up exponentially. No, So the cost of energy and the impact, of course, of producing energy uh, with, without uh, using uh, uh, renewable uh, sources uh, is, uh, is a strong limiting factor. But again, look at the convergence of technologies. For example, if uh, one day it will not be probably in the next five years, it will be longer term, we will finally achieve... Uh, nuclear fusion to, to produce to produce energy, then this would be mean having almost unlimited energy available with a very small, if not null, impact on, on the planet. Mm. Uh, so what today is not feasible, or it will be technically feasible, but it is not convenient to have, it will happen. So I think that in 10 years' time or so, again, we will see the emergence of a new generation of trains using maybe different technologies like the maglev and and the like. Uh, In 15 years, the development of new networks and infrastructures probably would uh, enable technologies like uh, the Hyperloop. Uh, I know that within our community, the Hyperloop is uh, seen uh, with some sort of uh, suspect uh, or, uh, or, let's say, mm, uh, skepticism. Okay, yes, it seems to be, (laughs) it's not a train (laughs) to, to a certain extent. But I think that uh, uh, if uh, the experimental networks that are being built over the world would prove it uh, to be a viable 
and uh, effective kind of transportation if we start uh, slowly to roll out. But the point is, what makes all this very complex to predict uh, what our industry would be in the next 15 years, is that if you look in retrospective, all the different uh, means of transportation have got a certain level of success, then they have been replaced uh, by other means, and then they came up again or so. Those, For example, intercontinental transportations was mainly based on ships. Okay, then uh, airplanes, both passengers and cargoes, uh, have substantially killed the ships uh, for passenger transportation, if not for leisure, whilst ships are still there for freight and uh, for goods. But look at the Belt and Road project and uh, how the uh, railways is being used uh, for freight between China or yeah, the, the Far road, East yeah. and, mm. uh, and, and Europe, no? Mm. It, everything is changed again then the, the train was replaced by cars over time because roads were built motorways were built and cars was a more convenient means of transportation on train but then the high speed train came in together with the speed limits for cars and congestions of mm. motorways and so the train again became more used than, than the car for uh, medium uh, and medium range uh, transportation, 200, 300, 400, 500 kilometers. And uh, it replaced also the, the, the airplane for this kind of uh, trips. But now we are seeing the emergency of uh, uh, self-driving cars that would make a better use of the motorways, uh, driving at the maximum possible speed in a safe way on motorways. Of course, of course, there is the issue of the coexistence of a human mm. driver and mm. a, a digital driver, but that's mm. a problem that will be solved g- gradually, and so on and so forth. So you see, there are waves. Each transport mean may go up, achieve a sort of maximum usage, and then it can be replaced by something else, mm. and so on and so forth. So in 15 years, uh, will the train be the transport mean for medium range uh, or up to 800 kilometers, let's say, distance or not? Uh, Will self-driving cars have an impact uh, on trains uh, because we could do something else uh, why the digital driver drives uh, instead of us? Or new generation of drones will appear that will be more convenient than uh, than trains? It's really difficult to predict, you know, because, again, if we look at uh, the evolution of... uh, some of this means in the past uh, years, now we are seeing things that were simply impossible to imagine 10 years, uh, 10 years ago. So saying what will happen in 15 years is really, is really a big bet. I think uh, you hit the nail quite firmly on the head there when you picture the wave cycle, as it were. Of, and we are, I think, probably at the bottom now of a wave that is going to ascend. And I think it's up to the railway community to make sure now that we are embracing the opportunity we are receiving and I think, um, and we need to harness that, harness that in the very best way. Gianluigi, in drawing this um, podcast uh, to a close, I would like to thank you very much indeed for the candor you have shown and the perspectives you've provided during this short interlude that we've been able to put together. And I think you will agree that it's clear that we must all of us embrace the opportunities that we have, work hard in a solidly, and I think we have to be collaborative manner to ensure that the services we are providing to the users, and I think this is something we need also to reflect on, is making sure that we bring the customer, the users of our services along with us in all of this. One of the things we have to do is to be efficient, cost-effective, and you mentioned the word safety when you were talking about autonomous vehicles, but I think we also need to make sure that one of the other raison d'être, as it were, of the railway system, is it is the safest form of land transportation. But I hope you've enjoyed this first podcast, but please join us for the next podcast. A big thank you to you, Gianluigi, for this, to the production team who have made all of this possible, and from us all here, thank you for listening, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>